So now you start to see the pattern. The idea is that you want to get as deep as possible. And why do you want to make your neural networks deeper and deeper? Because the deeper you go, the more abstract features you're going to learn about your image. The other one is as you go deeper, your receptive field is going to increase. So from layer one, you're looking at a three by three window of your image. Then as you go to the next one, you're looking perhaps at five by five window. If you go a little bit higher, it's going to become seven by seven. And deep into your neural network, you're looking at the entire image at your entire screen. And that's why people go deep because the deeper you go, you're gonna have more abstract features about a goldfish, for instance, as the object inside of one of your images. At the same time, you're increasing your receptive field. You're looking at your entire image. Okay, so far so good. So you want to go deeper, but there is a problem. Uh, and the problem is, yes, you go deeper, you increase the capacity of your neural network, but people were observing some uh, unexplainable behavior. You add more parameters to your network, you expect it to do much better on your training data and test data, but then uh, as you increase the capacity, your neural networks were not converging. They were not giving the performance that you like, not even on your training data. It means that in principle, your neural network can approximate very complex functions, but in practice, things were not working. So that's the idea of uh, highway networks. You want to fix that problem to some extent. And then later on, we are gonna go to residual networks, try to fix it even further. Let's take a single layer of a neural network. It could be convolution, it could be fully connected, but whatever that you do, you have an input to your layer, you have some weights and biases, which could be your convolutions or which could be your fully connected layers. You have some nonlinearity, and then that's gonna give you the output of your layer. So X goes in, Y is gonna come out, out of your regular layer in a neural network. And you could play around with your H. It's just a nonlinear transformation, which is parametrized. For instance, this could be an affine transformation. The, vector matrix multiplication plus a bias. That's an affine transformation. Vector matrix multiplication plus a bias. That's just a definition of affine transformation. And then you push it through a nonlinearity, maybe ReLU or TanH or sigmoid or Swish activation. That's gonna give you the output. This is a single layer. To fix that problem with deep neural networks having difficulty training, you might say, keep some portion of the previous layer. The current layer has an output. Keep some portion of that. Keep some portion of the previous layer through this C function. And then that's going to be your output, Y. Now X goes in, Y is going to come out. This is a generalization of a single layer. Why is that? If your T is one and C is always zero, you're going to get a single layer. So if your network during training decides to set t to be one and c to be zero, you're just fine. You didn't lose much. You're just back to the previous uh, setup. t, you're going to give it a name, transform gate. c is your carry gate. And these ideas are coming from gated recurrent neural network type of ideas, like LSTMs and GRUs. But these are good ideas on their own. You're introducing some gate from one previous layer to the current layer for the information to take a shortcut if they want to go through X. You set C to be one minus T. Why would you do that? Because you don't have to, but why would you do this? It's gonna reduce the number of parameters. In this case, WC is gonna be equal to WT. You're gonna have the same parameters. You're gonna be more parameter efficient. And then T is gonna take values between zero and one, so sigmoid is going to take values from negative infinity to positive infinity, and then it's going to squash them into zero and one. So your, your sigmoid is a function like this. It, it goes from zero to one. It means that this T at maximum is going to become a one, and at minimum, it's just going to become a zero. And if it becomes a zero, you're ignoring your nonlinearity. You're just skipping one layer. You're skipping over this layer. 
you're just going through X. You're just copying from the previous layer to this layer. Okay, so far so good. And then the question is, how do you initialize? We know how to initialize our weights and biases for a regular neural network, but how do you initialize W and B here? W is gonna be initialized randomly, which means zero and some variance, small variance. Here you can actually use the Xavier initialization. You can just Google the name, it's not that hard. So you're initializing your Ws to be near zero randomly, your beta or your bias to be a negative number. And these are large, relatively speaking, large negative numbers. What happens if B is negative three and W is around zero? What do you think is gonna happen to T? What values does it take? Zero. Yeah, perfect. So your sigmoid is like this, and then you are in the regime when your sigmoid is gonna become zero. It means that initially, this is zero or very close to zero. C is one minus zero, it's gonna be one. So you're always gonna go through your shortcut. You're always gonna copy from one layer to the next layer initially, but then later on things are gonna change throughout the training. This is the observation that I mentioned. Don't look at the figure on the right or the sub figure on the right yet. Look at the plane network. This is a network like this. Y is equal to some nonlinearity X, W, H. This is a plain and simple network. And then you are increasing the number of layers. Initially, you have 10 layers. Then you increase the number of layers to 20. You increase the number of layers to 50. You increase the number of layers to 100. You are going to look at your cross entropy error on your training data. This is not even your test data. This is on the training data. You are increasing the capacity of your neural network, but then something weird happens. This dashed green should be below the blue curve, but it's above it. You increase the capacity, your model is doing worse. You increase the capacity even further, your model is doing even worse. This is counterintuitive. You're giving your model more capacity, more parameters. You expect it to do much better on the training data, and it's doing much worse. Let's see if this idea fixes that. Let's just introduce uh, these gates, and it fixes it to some extent. The, actually, this is the 50 layer. The red dash line is doing better than your 10 layer. The 20 layer is still not performing as good as your 10 layer and your 100 layer is not performing better than your 50 layer deep. You pushed all of these curves down when you used highway networks compared to play networks. All of these curves are now down. They are performing better than before, but it's still the trend is mixed up. So to some extent, you helped your network train better, but you didn't fix the problem fully. And this problem we are gonna fix later on when we do ResNet we are gonna fix it fully. It's an improvement over previous state of the art, but it's not perfect. Why do people call it highway network? Maybe you can see it from the math here. These are the highways. When you go through X, these are your shortcuts. Let's see, if you look at all of these figures, you're gonna see that highway pattern, especially here. There seems to be some highways, but let's focus on BT. BT, we initialized it to be around negative three. During training, the values are going to change. This is the depth of your neural network. We are doing some experiments on MNIST. One layer deep, two layer deep, 10 layers deep in your neural network, 50 layers deep in your neural network. And maybe you have a lot of hidden units. And you have the same number of hidden units from one layer to the next one. This is just an experiment. And let's take a look at the value of BT after training. You see that these are still from negative 1.8 up until negative 2.7. So it means that there is a still bias or tendency towards going through the X route because T is still very close to zero. So you're just copying and pasting from one layer to the next layer. If you look at your transformation, your T, we said it's gonna be very close to zero after training and you can see yes, that is actually what is happening. Most of the time, your values are just around zero, except sometimes that, take, that they take non-zero values. This was for average over your data. You can take a look at single examples and you see the same pattern. 
it is most of the times zero, your t, except for some cases. And it's going to change from example to example. This is for one example. If you average these numbers out over multiple examples, that's going to give you the figure on top, right? Now let's take a look at your y. Your y is a vector, and these are your vectors from one layer to the next layer. And you can start to see this highway pattern that yes, you're copying and pasting your neurons from one layer to the next one. And that's where the name is coming from, highway networks. I think it's a good time to stop and answer questions. So just curious, um, on the plots on the left side of your screen, going back a little bit, um, so yeah, for plane networks, uh, it seems like the 10 layer plane network has a very similar cross entropy error as a 50 layer highway network. I'm assuming that the testing errors are pretty different between the two. Yes, absolutely. And it could be the case that uh, this 20 layer neural network is doing the best on your test data. But here you're just looking at the training and trying to push these curves down. The idea is that your model has a high capacity, it should be able to overfit. And then we are gonna worry about how to regularize later on, at least be able to train. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. There is a question on the chat. Are they sort of converging towards a minimum possible error? Uh, not necessarily. It should be able to push these errors even further down. So at least I would expect the 10 layer the 20 layer to do better than the 10 layer. It could be the case that MNIST is a very simple data set and you are sort of converging to the same numbers, but not quite. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Any other questions? So now you see the trend. Sometimes some people make an observation, they try to fix it, but that's not a perfect fix to the problem. And then when we go to ResNet, that is gonna help a lot with training neural networks. So yes, the, on the chat it says, so T stays close to zero because the network is lowering error by skipping the nonlinearity in a sense, exactly. So you can set your network to be as deep as possible, but then your neural network during training is gonna decide that it's gonna skip this nonlinearity and just copy and paste from the previous layer to the next one. And you can see it here. You're just copying and pasting this vector from one layer to the next layer. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Any other questions? I think it was a good idea to go through this paper because it's gonna give you much more intuition for why you would do residual connections.